Here's a fun fact that you need to know. Cubitus varus is a rare deformity of the forearm. Now you know. Patek Philippe released their first original collection in 25 years and the watch community has had a collective meltdown. I still have to find somebody that actually loves this watch. On a continuum from great to terrible, it seems that the lean is a little bit more to the terrible end of the scale. Whether you like the design or not, this is a huge release. It is, after all, 25 years since Patek last released a new lineup. So I've got some thoughts. What do I think of the watch? What are Patek trying to achieve with these watches? Is the meltdown people are having justified? Let's dive in. Obviously, I didn't get invited to the launch to meet Cherry Stern and get hands on. From an overall looks perspective, photos only, I think it's okay. In isolation, and that's key, in isolation, it's a reasonably nice square steel watch. It's not something I would gravitate towards. It reminds me a lot of a main watch or man main. It reminds me even more of the Bell & Ross BRX5. And if I was just gonna compare it to a square watch, I would choose a Cartier Santos over this watch any day of the week. As an integrated sports watch, it's not going to be in my top five. I would put the Royal Oak, the Parmigiani Tonda, the Chapek Antarctique, the Overseas, and the Ingenieur at the top. The Nautilus would be in my top 10, but the Cubitus wouldn't. The PRX would be above the Cubitus for me. There are a couple of things that concern me. The lug to lug is 44.9 millimeters, that sounds fine. The width is 44 and a half. All that doesn't sound like much, but square watches hit different. I think the largest of the Cartier Santos watches are only about 39, 40 millimeters wide. Although the lug to lug is less on the Cubitus than the Cartier Santos, the actual watch and dial face are a fair bit larger than a large Santos. With a diagonal length of 45 millimeters, you have to mentally think of this watch as wearing something like a 45 millimeter diameter round cased watch. That's Panerai and big pilot territory. You won't get a massive amount of overhang because of the short lug to lug, but dial wise, it's a 45 millimeter dial, including the bezel. That's not only significantly larger by about three, four millimeters than the Nautilus, but this is an objectively large wearing watch. It might be thin, but it's not dainty. My second concern is that this watch has the same challenge as the Nautilus has when it gets complicated. You see it on the 5822 that they released. I know that Patek have done these offset complications in Nautiluses before, but I've never really enjoyed many of them. Complications on square watches often look crap because they are incredibly hard to balance. This is, of course, entirely subjective, but there's just not enough real estate to build something that has balance, let alone symmetry. Finally, the steel version is over $40,000. I don't care if the ghost of Mother Teresa polished this case by breathing carefully on it from the afterlife for over a year. It's a steel watch with a gold rotor on the movement. I just made a video about overpriced watches and this one would definitely have been included. To sum up, it's okay. The reality though is that this watch is going to sell out. It's going to be hard to get. So what do I know? We have to go a little bit more than five years back when Thierry Stern said a couple of things, and he said them several times. The first thing he has said was that he didn't want Patek Philippe to become a one watch brand. He didn't want Patek to only be known for the Nautilus in the way that Audemars Piguet, largely unknown as the Royal Oak brand. His fear, which was entirely justified, was that they would be too dependent on the steel Nautilus, and as a consequence, they, in 2021, discontinued the Nautilus in steel. Since then, more and more steel Nautiluses have disappeared from the catalog, or at least have been produced at much lower numbers. Give it time, and I would bet that you'll likely also see the end of the Aquanaut in steel at some point as well. Stern was quoted in an interview with the Cubitus release for saying that the current production of Aquanauts and Nautiluses would now be spread across the Aquanaut, the Nautilus, and the Cubitus. So overall, fewer of all three models if you're counting them independently. The second thing Stern has been quoted as saying on occasion is that he wants Patek to have an accessible option for new clients. Now stop for a moment. $40,000 is now the accessible option for new clients. When you're down at the supermarket considering whether you should buy single ply toilet paper or splurging on dual ply, just remember, somebody out there thinks that $40,000 is accessible.
Third, Patek are trying to convince younger people to buy their watches. Cherry again is quoted as saying that with other lines and also with Acubitus. This is another try to hit a new younger target demographic. To recap, reduce dependency on the Nautilus and the Equinaut, provide an accessible option for new clients, get the kids to buy Patek. The quote about accessibility bounced around in my head because sometimes you have to pay attention to what isn't being said. A 6007G costs $40,000. A 5226G Calatrava costs $42,000. From a price perspective, they are entirely as accessible as the new steel Cubitus. What's not being said? Nobody wants a dress watch. At least not the 5226 or the 6007G. Patek have, over the last couple of years, been trying to make the Calatrava line a little bit more youthful, a little bit less stuffy. They've added color, they've thrown on more modern bracelets, but in the broader picture, those watches are not moving in the way Patek wants them to. They can try and push them all they want, but as an analysis I did a couple of months ago showed, watches like the 6007G barely trade at retail and usually go for less unlike the heavy hitters of the 5811s and the Aquanauts. The reality is people are not willing to just buy anything from Patek. They want a Nautilus as a minimum, not some nondescript colorful Calatrava. The $40,000 also bounced around in my head because to me the reality is that accessibility clearly isn't about price, it's about status. Patek have historically had two kinds of watches. They've had starter watches, as in the watches that you are expected to buy as your way into the brand. And then they have the desirable products, which are and have always been the complicated watches, the perpetual calendars, the moon phases, the chiming GMTs. Those are the watches Patek are protective of. Those are the ones where you need to earn your way into an invite to meet Thierry or some other executive at Patek. Those are the watches that sell above retail and go for millions at auctions. Those are the watches that have historically driven Patek's desirability. When you think about it, the desirability of the Nautilus and the Equinaut are a relatively new thing. The pin really dropped for me when I was thinking about this. Thierry Stern wasn't ever really talking about the Nautilus being too desirable. Thierry was talking about how the Nautilus was making all the other watches undesirable. That's what wasn't said. Too many customers were starting to just want a Nautilus and didn't care about the rest. The Cubitus has to be seen from that perspective. You have to have something that people will want, which addresses a market need, but isn't so desirable that it kills the interest in those high-end, ultra-profitable, complicated watches. If you're really conspiratorial, you could argue that ideally this starter watch shouldn't be too good. Ideally, it should be good enough because you don't want to recreate the Nautilus problem all over again. Business-wise, you can argue that there's an incentive to make an average watch. Not that I think they really did that entirely on purpose, but the incentive from a business perspective is definitely there. People are having a meltdown because they feel this watch is ugly. They're having a meltdown because it's called a reinterpretation of the Nautilus, and initially it's seen as an inferior interpretation. People are having a meltdown because they expected more from Patek. That and people are just hard to please. I'm not really having a meltdown. I think this watch is okay as a final result, but I'm sort of surprised that this was the best they could come up with. I suppose I have to elaborate on that. The Code 1159 from Audemars Piquet was not well received in its first iteration. I didn't think it was well executed either. You can check out my video, but for me, it was especially the dials that just didn't work. Especially the entry white dial was decidedly unimpressive. But since then, with various design iterations, the watch has actually improved a lot. Whether you like it or not, I would argue very strongly, actually, that the 1159 was a better first effort than the Cubitus. Granted, AP had a different problem. AP had to make something in their lineup that was not a Royal Oak. So the watch couldn't look anything like a Royal Oak. There are a few markers in the 1159 design, including the mid-case, that have design elements inspired by the Royal Oak. But by and large, it is its own design because it had to be. The Cubitus didn't have to be its own thing. Patek has more than the Nautilus. They have their simple dressy watches in the Calatrava line. They have the Ellipse as their quirky design, and they have all manner of variants of regular dressy but complicated watches. Their lineup is just more diverse than AP, so leaning more heavily on the Nautilus was not out of the question when it came to design. 
The Nautilus is also iconic, so it's natural to consider it as a starting point for your next watch. But it's also inherently risky. It's risky because you're inviting direct comparison with an icon. How hard do you think it is to be a son or a daughter of the world's best football player or Formula One driver or golfer, and you choose to play the same sport as mom or dad? You're going to be compared to mom and dad for the rest of your career. Do you really want that level of pressure, being told every day, you'll never be as good as your dad, Roger Federer? But fair enough, Patek was confident in their designers and said, no, we can do it. And most people are like, no, not really. Any good press is good press, I suppose. But if you're a designer that has put your heart and soul into a product, I guarantee you this is not the response you were hoping for. I'm not a designer, and me pretending that I could come up with a better design would just be wrong. But I do believe that choosing the Nautilus as the starting point was high risk from a success perspective, but also risk averse in the sense that they weren't confident enough in their ability to come up with something completely original from the bottom up. Now, granted, very few designs knock it out of the park in the first go, and most designs are not particularly good. But to me, the choice feels creatively bankrupt. Thierry Stern explicitly stated that he wanted to distance himself from the desirability of the Nautilus. But then he clearly chose the same Nautilus as his starting point. How is that not a massive contradiction that exposes your lack of confidence in your own creative ability? It also tells me that you already are a bit dependent on the Nautilus and you want some of that magic back. You say you don't want that Nautilus hype, but you kind of do, don't you, Thierry? It tells me you don't have the confidence to try something really daring. Not that Patek or the Swiss watch industry are particularly daring in general. On the contrary, really, this doesn't speak to a design team that has a belief in itself. In a way, this release actually makes me respect the Audemars Piguet and the Code 1159 more. It wasn't great, but they started with much more of a blank piece of paper and said, we have to try. Patek didn't. People are having a meltdown because it looks too much like a Nautilus, because it feels lazy. People are having a meltdown because one of the Holy Trinity was expected to be able to be more creative. Thierry even says his company is full of creative people. And this tells me I don't agree. They took the Nautilus bracelet. They took the Nautilus dial. They took a movement, which I'm pretty sure is the one that's in the 5226 as well, or at least a version of it. They took the Nautilus case construction and they made it square. Patek are skilled craftsmen and they are good at making great dials, but they're not good at true innovation. Blank page creativity is not a skill they possess. Patek and many, not all, of these high-end brands are not creative. I think Patek put effort in. I just don't think they were capable of more. Patek and some of those really old brands are anything but creative. They've made a ton of money making minor adjustments to successful designs, tweaking products, updating products, but rarely, if ever, do they come up with something truly new and good. It's not in their nature. A bar of creative thinking, I honestly think, is one that I don't think many of these brands, including Patek, could realistically clear on a regular basis. So for me, I differentiate between how I see the watch and how I see the watch came into being. The watch itself, to me, looks fine. It's a little bit too big probably, and not as good as the Nautilus, but it's okay. But as a creative process, as a product intended to both be and not be the future Nautilus, I think this is a creative failure. It's a half measure of sorts, and a clear sign that this was the best Patek could realistically come up with when the words originality and creativity were the ask. So what am I left with? I'm left with the feeling that Patek didn't design this watch from a place of confidence. They have a clear business need for an entry sports watch, but didn't believe enough in themselves to truly distance the new watch from their icon. So they reused the bracelet, they spiffed up the movement a little bit, and used the case construction, and made the watch a bit more square, and called it the Cubitus. I think it's okay. I don't think it's a disaster. It's the Nautilus Light. It's the safe choice from a brand that didn't have the confidence to lean further out. They stayed super close to their conservative roots, and to me, it proves that if I want a truly new, truly daring idea, I'm not going to look to an established conservative brand. The watch itself is going to sell out. It will be hard to get because the Patek brand is still the Patek brand. But Patek doesn't care what I think. I don't have $40,000 for a starter watch. The irony though is, if I'm wrong and all the haters are wrong, if this turns out to be a smash hit for Patek, they won't have solved their problem. They'll just have replaced the hype for the Nautilus 
with the hype for the forearm deformity. Like, subscribe. Cheers.